Hello, welcome to the Dreamers Podcast. I'm your host, Annie's Wealth. Thank you for tuning in for the first episode of 2023. It also happens to fall on my mother's birthday, Joyeux Anniversaire. So just like that, 2023 is here. And if you're listening to this episode at the beginning of 2023 in January, I'm really honored that you've made the decision to start your year with me. If you're listening to this episode later on, I'm still very grateful that you are giving this episode a chance. Thank you for rocking with me. Thank you for being here. And do not forget to hit subscribe so that you can get new episode automatically delivered to your phone or whichever device you're listening from. I am just getting back from the holiday break and not yet ready to release a brand new episode as I'm still taking some time to think and strategize on how I want to move forward as far as creating content for this podcast, for YouTube. And I'm still waiting to hear your feedback. So if you have an opinion on where I should take the show next, what kind of guest I should have, or if you have like a specific guest that you think would be in line with the show. Now is the best time to send me a note on Instagram at A-N-N-E-L-Y-S-E Wealth, Anne-Lee's Wealth. Let me know your thoughts. I mentioned in a previous episode that I was considering moving to releasing one new episode every other week as opposed to every week. I want to hear your thoughts about that. What do you think I should do? I'm still taking feedback into consideration. And I will be back very soon with a new episode. In the meantime, please enjoy this medley of episode on the top skills that you need to increase your income this year. In this episode, you'll hear from Angela Yee, Tanya Rapley, Mandy Woodruff, and Anthony O'Neill. All right, here it is. I never thought about investing. I never thought about being an entrepreneur. I never thought about owning a home. Those were not even thoughts in my head back then. As a matter of fact, I used to think that I would never be able to own a home, especially because living in the New York City area is so expensive. And every day I was really just trying to, I didn't even have money saved in my bank account. Mm -hmm. And so even just being able to go on a vacation, that was the ultimate treat for myself. My parents, my mom gave me her car. So I didn't have a car. I didn't have good credit. I didn't have any of those things. And then one day I told myself, Angela, you just have to make more money. I know that people would tell you, just don't buy that cup of coffee and mm-hmm. you know, just cut back on some of those daily expenses. But when you really want to make big moves, that's just not enough. And so I definitely had a lot of side hustles. I was doing some writing and it wasn't big money. And I also wasn't great at knowing what to ask for. And so I think that confidence comes in when you have more experience, because I was young, I was fresh out of college. None of my friends are really making a ton of money. So we were all kind of struggling together. And that's why part of it is who's around you, Mm -hmm. because we did support each other and celebrate our wins. But I don't think any of us were seeing the bigger picture of what was possible. What really helped me learn that was being around people who were doing way better than I was. And so one of those people that I really learned a lot from early on was now Rogers. And at the time, he owned a distribution label. Even now, just seeing the moves that he makes as far as investing and as far as his own catalog and publishing and even things outside of music, that's fascinating to me. But I remember having a meeting with him and him explaining to me how he was making money owning this distribution label. That's when ownership really started to feel important to me. When I was listening to him talk about the things that he was doing, when he was telling me stories about the publishing that he was getting and the checks that he was getting from songs that he had done decades ago, that was what really hit home to me. And so one of the first things that I did do was get a job making more money. And in that job, by the way, before I got that job, I was freelancing. So I was making about $80,000, $90,000 a year from freelancing. And then I ended up taking some steps back when I decided I wanted to work in radio. And so I went from making Mm. that back down to making $50,000 a year because this was a job that was in a field I had never done before. It was to be the host on a morning show. They felt like they were taking a chance on me in a field I had never been in. I had to understand that, okay, 
in order for me to later on excel, I've got to take some steps backward financially. I did that. I gave up all my freelancing and I gave up that extra money I was making to go back to making $50,000. And mm-hmm. after the first year of making 50000 I went in and renegotiated because I was doing well enough that I felt like, you know, sometimes it's hard because you start so low. It's hard to go up when you start low. And I didn't know how to negotiate. So when they offered me that, I didn't even negotiate. I mm-hmm. just took it. What I did do was, though, the next year was go in and ask for a raise. And they did give me a bonus and a raise. For me, it was setting a goal and being able to achieve that goal and knowing that I had the ability to make money outside of just my salary. I had the ability to host events. I had the ability to do freelance writing. And I had the ability to do event planning. All of those things brought in extra income. So once you started, you know, you reached that six figures and you decided that you wanted to earn more. Did you have a number in mind? I think every time, and this is what's funny too, is that even my price for things went up. I used to be excited to get paid $250 to host something. Then it was like, okay, now I'm upping my price to $500. Then it was like, okay, now it's $1,000. Then it was, I'm not leaving my house if it's less than $2,000. So you get to the point where you're charging $20,000 for a little bit of time or $40,000 to do a post. Those were numbers that I never even would have thought I would be able to get. I remember I brokered a deal. I didn't have to do much at all. I brokered a deal for somebody and got $150,000 just to introduce one person to another person. Hmm. And then once the deal worked out, I was able to get a nice fee just for that and with minimal effort. I think that the more money you make, because after that, I was like, I want to make a million dollars. The more money you make, the more you realize that you need to work smarter and not harder. Hmm. I need my money to make money. I feel like if I have a whole lot of money just saved in the bank, that doesn't feel good to me because it's not doing anything. Whether I'm investing in real estate, investing in businesses, investing in people, investing in myself, investing in the stock market, I do feel like there's no reason to have a whole bunch of money just in the bank. You wrote on Twitter that becoming an entrepreneur changed my life. I'm thankful that seven years ago, I realized my career path was not going to lead to the life I desired and did something Mm -hmm. about it. I was a nonprofit and I had this misconception that in order to do well, you had to work at a nonprofit. In order to impact and change lives, you had to work at nonprofit organizations. But whenever you're working for anybody else, there's a ceiling on your income. And based on what I wanted for my life, I mean, yeah, I might have stayed at a nonprofit and made like six figures, but I wanted a lifestyle that afforded me five flexibility and six figures, not six figures, but I'm overworking. I'm there at the job every day and I'm basically just living to work. And so I know that becoming an entrepreneur expanded my income earning potential, which is essentially limitless and gave me the ability to control my time. It gave me the ability to show up for my son. It gave me the ability to determine what my maternity leave would look like. It gives me the ability to decide, I want to take December off to focus on this. And so my core values are joy, personal growth, freedom, and relationships. And being an entrepreneur allows me to nurture my relationships how I see fit. It allows me to tap into moments of joy and create moments of joy and make time for joy. I'm always growing. I'm always learning. I think that that's one of the key factors of being a successful entrepreneur is continuing to learn and freedom. Freedom to decide. In September, I decided I wanted to go away for three weeks. And I was in Tulum in Mexico City and was gone for three weeks. It's that freedom. So it allows me to exhibit and live my core values. And on the Marcus Garrett show, you said that you had to get rid of the cap mentality to be able to earn as much as you do now. I'm curious to hear, how did your relationship with money change over the years? How did you get to a point where you don't have that cap mentality? Any resources, advice that you can share with the listeners? My spiritual foundation was grounded in Christianity. And then I've studied several other religions and I'm really big on the Church of New Thought, which is Eckhart Tolle, Emily Cady, a lot of those kind of like law of attraction and understanding the power of your thoughts. And I started to do little tests. So there's this book called Thank and Grow Rich by Pamela Grout, where you do these, they call it experiments to just see when you put something out there, how everything responds and how God responds, how you find like money places. Things just start to happen when you believe that they will happen and when you set the intention. And those books helped me. And around that time, I began to hone the belief that everything begins with the intention. And if I have the intention to be abundant, if I have the intention to be supported on the path to my abundance, then that's what I will receive and that's what I expect. 
And once I started to see that work for me in my life and not understand that things are always working for my greater good, it just started to change. And now I was like, it's not a matter of if I need something, oh, that's not available to me. It's a matter of if I need or want something, okay, that's what I need and want. I'm being honest about my intention. Let's make it available. I believe that I have the power to co-create my existence with God. And so I'm like, God, this is what I need for this next chapter. Give me the signs. Give me the guidance on what I need to do to make this happen. I will do my work. But I know it's available to me. And I think that growing up, I didn't always have that belief. I thought that things were only available to certain people or things were only available to people who had certain educational backgrounds or certain relationships. And now I know if I want those relationships, I can have them. If I want those opportunities, I can have them. And so it was a major switch for me because it went from feeling limited to feeling limitless as long as I was honest and asked for what I wanted. So do you think wealth is available to anyone? I think it's it's dual fold. I think wealth can be available to anybody. I don't know if it's part of everyone's divine assignment. I don't know if it's what everybody desires for themselves, but I think that it can be available. And if someone decides, I know that maybe this wasn't supposed to be my experience, but actually this is what I want my experience to be. I think that it can be available. And I think that one of the things that I also learned was to embrace wealth in all forms. And wealth is not limited to the monetary. Wealth can be your family structure. Wealth can be support. You can have a wealth of love. You can have a wealth of opportunities. You can have a wealth of influence and impact. So I think that wealth is available to us in different ways. And that is available to us all. Talk to me about the art of the pivot. Like, how do you know when to pivot and how to pivot? The thing is, if you are doing the work of upskilling and having a strong professional brand, it's going to be hard for you not to have opportunities coming to you. A lot of women come to me and they feel stuck. At this point, they know they want something new. They want to pivot, but because they haven't invested in their professional brand or their upskill, the opportunities aren't coming to them. And I do believe in the power of opportunities coming to you versus you having to go out there and always hunt them down. So for me throughout my career, I mentioned I quit six times, right? Of those six new jobs that I took, only one of them I applied for. The other five came to me. And that was the very first job I took after I was laid off and I was desperate. And I was like, I'll do anything. So from there, it was referrals. It was someone remembering or seeing my work. That job at Insider, why'd they hire me off the street? I didn't have any personal finance experience. It was because a former editorial assistant at a magazine I interned at had followed my blog. I started a blog about biking in New York and she was like, you're a great writer. I'm hiring a writer. Do you want to try to write about money? So it was, again, me sharing that work so that she could see it, attracting that attention, getting that opportunity. And from there, the same thing from Insider to Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance loved my work at Insider, got me noticed. I literally was writing for the Yahoo Finance editors. I wanted a job there, but I knew I had the best shot at getting one if they were loving and seeing my content. That's what I mean by attracting those opportunities to you. So I guess it's very important for us to not only know how to pivot or when to pivot, but also have to make yourself attractive the next opportunity. You have to be poachable. I talk with my makers all the time about being as poachable as possible. You don't want to be the best kept secret. Don't play hard to get. I mean, I wasn't out there like with a hire me sign on the side of the street, but I was consistently showing up in the spaces where people who I wanted to hire me were hanging out. And by that, I mean, at the conferences with other media leadership, I was showing up at the conference where the founder of that company that gave me my start as a content director, where he was at. Magnify Money, a personal finance marketplace. He was at FinCon. I put myself at FinCon. You know, I didn't have to go there. That was my choice to go into network. How are you putting yourself in the path of people who could give you opportunities? And then when you're in their path, how are you showing up? Are you someone who's going to be on the speaker list as a panelist or as a speaker? Are you someone who's associated with a cool project that's going to get an award that people in the audience are going to want to know? So how can you not be the best kept secret and how can you make yourself super easy to contact? Put your email address out there, be on LinkedIn, put together a portfolio and publish it, share your stuff. It's really challenging for a lot of people to get over that hump of self-promotion because it seems like icky and cringe, but what's the alternative? You're going to continue being stuck, right? That's a lot of what I do with the women I work with is shove them over the cliff so that they start to share their work and get noticed.
when you influence and impact people, it produces income. I think if we focus on influencing and impacting people, we can produce income. If we chase income, we won't influence and impact people. One thing I have learned, especially like doing what I do, if I serve a lot of people and if I help a lot of people get close to their goals and close to their dreams, the reward for serving is green, it's income. And so I think people say, well, Anthony, I'm not an influencer like you. I don't have a YouTube channel. Cool, great. When you get on your job and let's say you work for Target. Okay, cool. How do you influence every person that walks through that door that comes up to you at the cash register? How do you impact that person who's looking for that particular gene or that particular heel? How do you make them smile? How do you make them remember, man, I really liked her. I really liked him at this particular store. I want to come back to Target. I want to come back to Target because you impacted me. Because you impacted me. I told your boss. I told the manager. I really liked the way she took care of me and the way she served me. She made me feel embraced here at Target. Thank you, Target, so much. Cool, great. Now your manager is looking at you because of what you've done. You've influenced and you impact. Now you get a promotion, which is more income, more income, which is good in your resume. Now you can go from there and build upon that. And so everyone keeps saying, well, Anthony, I'm not an influencer. How do I influence and impact people? You influence and impact people anywhere, everywhere you are. If you work in the taxi, we're in the tax season right now. If you're someone helping people file taxes, hey, how are you educating people on how to save money? Everyone that sits down in your chair and engages with you, the first step should not be, okay, how can I make more money off of this individual? No, the very first step should be, okay, how can I influence and impact this individual's life? And they come back, whether to my business or whether to this store. Let's say you're an employee. There's nothing wrong with you asking them, hey, yo, if I've served you well, would you mind sending my supervisor or my manager an email just letting you know of your experience with me and this amazing company that I have the opportunity to work for? You do that. That produces income. And I remember chasing in companies and not influencing people and not impacting people. And that turned around to bite me because now I became money hungry. And when you become money hungry, you'll do things that hurts people. You'll do things that's misleading to people. Now no one will trust you. Nobody wants to work with you because you was trying to chase income, the money today. Now you lost money because you did people wrong. But if you flip it, if you're always influencing, impacting people, you'll always be making money. I hope you enjoy today's episode highlighting some of the top skills that you need to increase your income this year. All right. I will see you back next week for episode 104. 